I would like to introduce Shudha, Shudha Kar Ramakrishna. He's an executive VP, vice president, and general manager of Unified Communication Product and chief development officer of Polycom. He has great experience in wireless technology and telephony, networking, and security, and he holds several uh, patents. Um, his leadership experience in the industry has made him a key player in business development strategy, merger acquisition, startup development, and finance. Uh, let me welcome again Ramakrishna. I can uh, officially say good afternoon to everybody. It's just past noon. Uh, how many of you have had lunch here? Oh, a few. So I'm between lunch and you guys. So I'm going to try to keep my comments brief and make it as interactive as possible. How many of you have heard of Polycom as a company? Just a uh, show of hands. It's a few. Uh, we are a leader in voice and video communications, and we've used our strength in voice and video communications to do collaboration, to improve productivity, primarily of enterprise customers, which is the reason why you may not all have heard about us. But as you get into the workforce, I can guarantee you that every company that you work at, or any company that you work at, will have a Polycom product. For instance, the conference phone systems that we have, we have uh, upwards of 90% market share, which goes back to any company that you work for, you are bound to see a Polycom product. Today, however, I'm not going to really talk to you too much about Polycom as a company because that may be interesting for many of you, but I want to broaden my scope and talk about communication, collaboration, and productivity and why it is relevant to all of us here. Although I've been in the industry for several years and I am part technologist and part businessman, I'm at heart an academic. So I really consider this my privilege to actually be talking to all of you and thanks again for the invitation. And so every time I get an opportunity whether to go and present at an engineering school or a management school, I take it upon myself to go and basically share my experiences. Basically share my experiences. And most of you are in the engineering school, and as you evolve, you will shape your own thought processes as to what's relevant to you, which direction do you want to take your careers. And after this meeting, I'm happy to spend a few minutes if anybody is interested to talk or offline as well. Okay. Let, let me go back to the theme, which is to communicate, collaborate, and be productive. And the reason why I chose it this way is each one of you, as you go into the industry or you even create your own business, which I hope many of you will do sometime soon, you will work in a global workplace. You will have global interactions. It's very rarely the case that you're going to be boxed into your own small world and can disassociate yourself from everybody else in the world. That's the reason why a lot of what I'm going to talk about is got to do with broader aspects than relevant to just one company or one industry. Okay, so bear that in mind. And I'm going to try to open this up for Q&A and spend as much time interacting with you as possible and keep my presentation to a minimum. So what I wanted to talk about is what is unified communication? What are the trends? Just to give you a sense for the opportunity, the Polycom context will be very brief and what it means to succeed in a global workforce. Let me first define what we mean by unified communications. How many of you have heard of the term unified communications? Just a show of hands. OK, a few people. How many of you have done courses in networking or communications, TCP IP, um, socket programming, things of that kind? So quite a few of you. In some way or another, you are contributing to the unified communication space when you work in those areas. Okay? And one of the things that I'm going to talk about is the market size and the market potential and how you can potentially shape yourself into that space. How I came into that industry is I did uh, research in distributed systems when I was in grad school. We built a complete distributed operating system. That was my thesis. 
when I was in grad school. And so one thing led to another. You get into distributed computing systems, networking, early days of TCP IP, then the web took over, and then one thing leads to another, and you go up the stack, so to speak. And unified communication is basically providing the ability to people to communicate from wherever they are, regardless of the location, regardless of the device, and enabling them to be collaborating and enabling them to be more productive. That's our definition of use, unified communications. So when we define it from a polycom context, we call it UC everywhere. The idea is you don't have to be in your office to be communicating or collaborating. You can be anywhere. You can be in your home office. You can be on, my, on a mobile tablet. You can be half the distance away on the globe, or you can be essentially everywhere. You can be anywhere and everywhere to be collaborating. While it sounds simplistic to make that statement, the technological challenges to make that happen are quite immense. And as an industry, the challenge for us is to figure out how we simplify those capabilities, how we eliminate those complexities, and yet allow people to have a very consistent user experience and user interface when they communicate between themselves. And then I'll go into why it is relevant to you, because not only will you be users of it, but hopefully you can contribute to that ecosystem, expand that ecosystem, and actually make a career out of it as well, for many of you that are interested. As I was coming in, I heard some people say that you're doing research in voice technologies. You're doing research in multiple microphone technologies, and so on and so forth. All of those are underpinnings or technology elements necessary to make unified communications happen. Without speech, there's no unified communications, for instance. Without video, there's restricted unified communications. Without the ability to share content, there's not much of a collaboration going on. You can love to speak, but where's the collaboration happening? And then the analytics, the recording, the streaming, all of those things together form the ecosystem. So, I'll highlight a few topics um, for you here in terms of market statistics. Most of you have heard about the movement to the cloud. A lot of you, I'm sure, have heard about cloud computing. Are there any courses in cloud computing here? No. Uh, a program in cloud computing? OK. But the idea is unified communications and services in general are moving more and more towards the cloud for some very basic reasons ease of access, economies of scale, and quickness to deploy. So that's one factor that's happening. Two is unified communication is going into multiple device types, tablets, desktops, SMB customers. What that does is it creates greater access to people. In the past, it was not so easy to be able to say all this because bandwidth was restricted. Not a lot of people worry about bandwidth these days whether it be in wireless networks or wireline networks. There's also another important statistic I want to give you. There is proven research that says that countries who have invested in broadband, their GDP growth is much faster than company, countries that have not done it. A lot of us might think if you're a rich country, you will invest in broadband. The causal effect is actually the reverse, which is if you've already invested in broadband, your GDP actually accelerates at a faster growth rate. What that does is making broadband more accessible gives people more tools to be able to communicate. And that's the reason why we believe there is significant scope for proliferation. Also, till recently, and not a lot of us were using video as a way of communicating. Today, Skype supports video. Uh, Apple devices support video. Obviously, we, as Polycom, have been providing very high quality video capabilities and conferencing capabilities in an enterprise setting. So it's becoming more and more ubiquitous. And the lines are getting blurred between consumers, enterprises of different kinds, and we have to provide the linkages necessary to bring them all together. That's really what the challenge for the industry is. And that's, I think, where the opportunity is for a lot of people like you. To give you a sense for it, 
when we talk about unified communications and unified communications and collaboration, they're part of the broad IT industry. And that happens to be a 1.4 trillion industry, and it's growing, and it's growing. Within the IT industry, it'll come back. I'll, I think I remember my slides. I'll keep talking. Within the IT industry, unified communication is the second largest growing segment. Virtualization, how many of you have heard of virtualization? A lot of you. Are there courses in virtualization here? Yes. Great, because that's an extremely important technology as you move into the cloud. How do you virtualize services? How do you deliver services using the same infrastructure to many different enterprises, reduce cost, increase economies of scale? Next to virtualization, unified communications is the fastest growing segment in the industry. That gives you a sense for the demand. That gives you a sense for the need. And that gives you a sense for the opportunity. Right? Speaking about opportunity, I've been in your shoes not too long ago. When you're finishing up your studies, when you're coming out into the industry, when you're thinking about what to do next, whether it's take up a job, or whether it is to start a company, and so on and so forth. Luck is when opportunity meets preparation. I'm sure you, some of you have heard that quote. Luck is when opportunity meets preparation. And the emphasis there is preparation. The reason why I'm sensitizing you to some of these things, and I'm sure other speakers have done the same, is to give you a sense for what are those possibilities out there. It's to give you a sense for what those trends are such that you can prepare yourself based on your interests, experience, expertise, education, and channel your energies to meet the opportunity. That's when you stand, start getting lucky, so to speak. It's not going to fall on your lap. You just need to prepare for it and grab it when it happens. So the point I'm making here is it's a huge industry. It is growing at a rapid clip. And we believe it will continue to grow at a fairly rapid clip. So the tools that you need, prepare yourself to engage in this workforce. And I think there's tremendous opportunity for innovation. Tremendous opportunity for innovation, self-fulfillment, and obviously financial gains. So speaking about some of the things that we spoke about, we are a leader today. And we want to continue to build on our leadership with regards to face-to-face -face collaboration without being in the same room. The goal for most of companies, including ours, I mean, IBM is one of our customers. They have researchers all over the world, right? So suppose you want to work on a research problem. Suppose you want to have a conference. The old-fashioned way of doing it is you bring everybody together into a room, maybe give them a few whiteboards, lock them up, and ask them to communicate, collaborate, and be productive. That is no longer the case. We have significant technology and tools where you don't really need to do any of that stuff anymore. You don't need to travel a single mile. You can be in your office. You can be in your home office. You can be sharing a whiteboard between two enterprises or two locations and drawing up a design without moving from where you are. That requires a lot of technical innovation because you have to appreciate user experiences. You have to make it appear like you're in the same room. And you have to improve productivity. How do you do that? There's a lot of technical problems, technical challenges, technical opportunities using which we can do it. We have solved a lot of those problems, and we continue to solve more problems as services get moved over to the cloud, as more devices, including tablets, how many of you have a tablet device or have seen a tablet device? A lot of you have seen it. Most of us today use it for entertainment, right? Or some of us may use it for work, but on a very restricted basis, on a very restricted basis. It can, it can be a significant productivity tool. And we all know about the BlackBerry thumb. Uh, I don't know if you know about the the issue with the BlackBerry, where people are so connected and communicating all the time that your thumb goes sore because you're punching keys all the time. That's a medical condition for which there is a treatment. Okay? 
the point I'm making is you're almost always connected, you're almost always online, and you're almost always communicating. Right? And in the process, we are figuring out ways of how to make it easier, how to make the experience painless, and yet how to deliver a level of productivity that does not require people to painfully go from one location to another and be physically present in the same room to be able to communicate and collaborate. Especially as the world becomes larger, with more and more companies diversifying throughout the world, that becomes a critical problem. You waste a tremendous amount of time just traveling. I mean, it's fun to travel on leisure, go to a new place, learn a new culture, and all of those things. But to constantly travel to get anything done is not a very productive endeavor. And our goal, our mission, is to make those activities as less painful as possible and hopefully completely eliminate the need in many cases. Okay, so one of the things I'm gonna highlight, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this, is any time you work in a workplace, even do a project or even learn a course or sit in a class, it's extremely important to understand the context by context, it is a reference under which you think, reference around which you act, and you innovate, and you organize your activities, right? So this is our Polycom innovation context. How many of you have worked with TCP IP or NFS, given that you're largely engineering students, or some kind of standard, like HTML? All of you, or most of you. Standards are very important because as you try to bring all of these various islands together, you need a standard, you need a definition. Otherwise, everybody becomes an island. If you do what you want to do on your own, and if TCP IP was not a standard, we probably would not have the, had the internet. We wouldn't have the World Wide Web. And then as HTML came up, we started building content pages, and other content creation happened in a very standard way which is you follow a certain specification, you bring it together, it will work. That's the power of a standard. We are deeply committed to standards. We are deeply committed to applications because communication is great, but unless you have an application context, it's no good. Let me give you an example. You have TCP IP, which is a communication engine, but you have email that's running on top of TCP IP. That is the application. So without applications, there's really no true collaboration or sharing of information or improvement of user experiences. And then the experience aspect is important because everybody loves devices like an iPad because you have a wonderful experience with it and you want to use it more because it's simple, intuitive, and you kind of get dragged to it on and on and on. Some of you may hate iPad. I see people shaking their heads. But you, I'm sure you like some other device that you go back to on and on and on. So it's about user preference and how do you make it attractive. And then the access piece is important because you're not fixated to your desk anymore. You have mobile devices, you have tablets, you have other forms of access that you can leverage your applications. So as a company, we believe in all of those four dimensions and those define our innovation context. Why am I highlighting that here? It is relevant to all of you as you organize your work activities, as you go into the industry, or create a business. What is your context? What do you want to stand for? How do you go about recruiting the right people? How do you send your message? How do you make sure that people understand what you're talking about? And how do you explain the relevancy of it? All of those things are your context. And we have an innovation context. I'll urge you to think about your own context as you get into what you plan to do next. Okay? Giving you a quick example of what we mean by collaboration tools. Since we are in an educational institute here, this is an example relevant to education. Using our technology, we are able to share the classroom, have interactive whiteboards, record the classroom sessions, come back and revisit those classroom sessions, conduct analytics, which is what did the professor say 
after the first half an hour? How many times did he use the word communications in his presentation? What was the theme behind the presentation that was made? What is the summary of that? So all sorts of analytics can be created using the tools and technologies that we have. Why are we doing it? We use our communication capabilities to help people collaborate and as a result become productive. Unfortunately, you're not able to attend a particular class. You want to stream it onto your tablet as you're sitting on a train and going home. You can do that with technologies like this. Therefore, you're always com connected you're always able to communicate, and you can be totally productive regardless of where you are. So those are the things that are possible. And I would say this is only the tip of the iceberg. As more people like you come into the workplace with more fresh ideas, fresh new perspectives, you can create more use cases. You can create more use cases using the same underlying technology. Okay? I'm going to wrap this up with a few pointers for you to think through as you finish your education, get into the workforce. And I've intentionally avoided highlighting any technical related things. Why? Because as the world diversifies, just having technical capabilities is not going to cut it. Simply not going to cut it because you won't succeed in a global workplace just by sitting in your cubicle doing what you're doing. At least you won't realize your full potential. So I highlighted a few suggestions for you to think about as you go through. One is diversity. The diversity has very specific connotations, but I have a very broad definition here. Diversity could mean where you're from. It could mean what location you're in. Basically, your ecosystem that defines and shapes your behavior, your thought processes, and your ability to innovate. So be appreciative of diversity. Not everybody's going to think like you. Not everybody is going to behave like you. Not everybody has similar ideas. The challenge for us is how do we work in that world? How do we appreciate each other's viewpoints and then channel those viewpoints for the collective good of your enterprise, whether it's owned by you or somebody else? So that's a very important thing. Language barriers. I'll give you an example. Um, how many of you believe you know voice communications from the standpoint of how frequencies are leveraged and measured, and how much bandwidth is used for a voice call. Communication classes? Okay. There is narrowband voice, which typically uses about 4 kilohertz of bandwidth, and there's wideband voice. There are cases where engineers in China are talking to engineers in India, let's say on a narrowband voice channel, a lot of frequencies are lost. A lot of frequencies are lost. So we are building technologies to make that communication more effective as well by creating higher bandwidth voice technologies, which we call HD voice, where the syllables are more clearly captured, where all the frequencies are clearly captured, and there's no real loss of communication. Because where there is loss of communication, there's loss of effectiveness, as you all know. So even basic things like that are extremely important as you get into diverse cultures with different languages. And many times, English is not going to be the first language of the people that you're going to be interacting with. But yet, that is the language of business. So how do you make sure that that happens? And how do you appreciate cultural and language and national boundaries and backgrounds? Another thing that is true today is hyper-competition. The world is not going to be stagnant, even for a few hours in many cases. Those that are a bit older than even me might understand that many times, for 20 years, technology wouldn't change rapidly. Today, we see things happening rapidly. Facebook, as an example, is about a five, six-year-old company, at best. At best. It's got 500 million users. 500 million users. World Wide Web, which we take for granted today, didn't happen till 1993-1994, right? So the world is rapidly changing, and there's hyper-competition. I mean, you don't know where your competition is going to come from and hit you. Everybody wants your lunch. 
And the fact that anybody is able to communicate and access the World Wide Web and information is the barriers to information exchange have reduced significantly. So keep that in mind as you go through and appreciate competition in a much more broader way than we traditionally are used to or what marketing textbooks might teach you. That you're going to get in the real world. <laughs> Continuous communication, we spoke about it. Thriving in a matrix environment. Again, it goes back to what I was saying, which is you're developing in one place, you're manufacturing in another place, you're selling in a third place, and you're supporting from a fourth place. It's not all happening in the same confines. So it's extremely important to be able to matrix with people, build relationships, and ensure that the cultural diversities are taken and maximized from a productivity standpoint. These are some things that I will leave you with that are far beyond any technical education that you're going to get. Because I would ask that even on day one in the workforce, you start becoming sensitive to these things. Because a lot of times people fail not because they're not C++ experts or Java experts or couldn't come up with the best algorithm in the shortest possible time, but because they don't appreciate these things and they don't pay enough attention to these things and they like to believe everybody in the world is going to behave and operate like they do. And that can be the biggest failure of many people and I'd urge you to be sensitive to it and not let this be your Achilles heel. Okay? Those were my prepared slides. I'm going to turn it back to you and have you ask me anything that's on your mind or any questions, comments, suggestions. Anything is fine. If you want to learn more about the technology or the company, that's fine too. Hello. Um, how important is global net neutrality to uh, unified communications? Global net neutrality, you said? I, I was going to say at the beginning, I'm not going to talk about political topics here. But uh, I'll talk about that. If we had net neutrality, that would be even better to basically open up the barriers, right? Um, if customers or service providers are going to start prioritizing traffic, charging for specific traffic types, and so on and so forth, that certainly will be an impediment in terms of the adoption rates, because it just becomes that much more expensive for people to use uh, the technology. But I frankly don't believe in the continuum of challenges, so to speak, to make that happen. I don't believe that will be a huge issue, uh, both economically as well as from an operation standpoint. I don't expect it to be a major problem. How would this unified communication play out? Uh, would I see that uh, Skype or Polycom will dominate the market? Uh, therefore, everybody subscribe to your service, then we have this uh, communication from any point to another point. Or I can call a polycon system from a Skype or from Cisco telepresence and, and that, that, that sort of deal. First of all, at every opportunity, buy a polycom system. That'll be always a wise choice, okay? Um, but more seriously, today, polycom has built technologies that can integrate with Cisco telepresence um, right away. Uh, you don't need to wait for that to evolve or play out. So why did we choose to do that? Going back to my slide on context, we believe in standards and we believe in interoperability. And we also believe that will be a business necessity. Let me give you an example. Let's say there are two companies. One is a Polycom customer, another one is a Cisco customer, right? And one company buys the other and they now become the same company. You can't really expect them to say, okay, uh, now I'm one company, I'm gonna choose one of the two equipment types and re replace one of them and then buy everything fresh. That will be against the philosophy of what is right for the customer. So what we decided to do was build the technology necessary to create a bridge between those islands. What it enables then is customers to have more choices and be able to realize the benefits of unified communications rather than pushing them into one corner and saying you only have one choice. You mentioned a few players, but there are many other players who are in the same marketplace, like IBM, Microsoft, and others, who all bring their different views into the marketplace, and you have to work in an ecosystem and then compete in that ecosystem and win. Okay? Could you just prefer more questions? 
Those, those things you point out at the end, toward the, uh, the end of your presentation about yeah. how our students should be prepared themselves. What, what can we do? What can students do? And, you know, other than attend, other than attend your uh, uh, presentation to learn about this yeah. occasionally, but on a day-to-day -day basis, what, what can students do to prepare themselves? There's a few things that I can suggest. I'm not saying it's an all-exhaustive list. One is you can read books about various cultures. You can read books about various histories. That might sensitize you to things. You can pick your friends who are more diverse than you are, as opposed to just being exactly like you are, so that you get a different set of perspectives. A third one, which may or may not be practical for all of us, might be to travel to selected countries to get exposed. I find that to be a fantastic way. Like they say, seeing is believing. When you're there in that culture, you get integrated, you will appreciate it far better than if you just try to read it or watch it on television or whatever. So it's a combination of things that you can do uh, other than things like this. The reason why I highlight that much more so than anything else is exactly what I said, which was the workforce is becoming more global. Everybody is required to participate in an ecosystem that's the entire world, not just your region. And so how do you succeed? How do you play, in that, play that game? How do you succeed in that game? Uh, only through appreciation. Only through appreciation. Your company um, provides solutions for communications overseas and all that kind of stuff. But my, my question is for the bigger problem. Isn't it true that different diversities and different cultures communicate differently? Oh, yeah. So it's not the technology that's limiting people, but people's values in different countries? Absolutely. So how do you solve that problem from your company's point of view? Absolutely. I, I think that's a fantastic question. Let me give you some of the things that we can do. You're never really going to solve the complete communication barrier, right? You can make it easier. You can make it as intuitive as possible. Technology can only go so far, right? Humans are the most complex beings there are, and they have a tendency to overcomplicate things on an ongoing basis. Let me give you some of the examples that we um, are doing. We have the ability where, let's say you have um, four people talking on a video conferencing system. Let's say one is talking in Spanish, another one is in Chinese, another one is talking English, and another one is in French, as an example. We should be able to create a capability where you're talking in your native tongue on one hand, but as you're talking, you're transcribing it into a common denominator. Let's say you're transcribing it into English. So regardless of how, what you're talking, there's always a certain translation mechanism that enables you to talk even though you're literally not talking the same language. So that's one. So there are multiple different variations of that that you can create to break down the barriers of how people communicate and eliminate their cultural barriers. Because you know, if in some languages, you have a tendency to use a particular word that may be completely opposed in a different language. So we have the ability to do some natural language processing, transcribing, and creating some least common denominator effects to enable the productive aspects of communication. But can we completely eliminate cultural barriers and nuances? Absolutely not. Frankly, I don't believe any technology should try to eliminate those because you're kind of minimizing the effectiveness and the richness and the value that the diverse cultures bring to the mix. Hi. Uh, do any of your specific products uh, directly impact uh, productivity uh, rather than just connecting and setting up a, a common workplace? Sure. Um, let me explain it in the following way. I gave you that example of the whiteboard technology that being, let's say you are in India and somebody else is in China, you can actually do a design review right on an interactive basis. So. That, to me, is a productivity enhancer. I'll tell you why. Maybe it's an indirect way of doing it, but that's a very basic example. You would have to get on a plane, get to China, have the conversation, suffer a jet lag, be half productive, and then come back, if that wasn't the case. All those hours are recouped, because you have, don't have to do that. All those hours are recouped 
such that you can then apply those hours for other productive means. So in that sense, the net output per hour, so to speak, of productivity rises because you're putting every hour into some productive endeavor or not. So that's just one example that I can give you about that. Okay, if there's no more questions, good luck. Good luck.